In this tutorial, we're going to look at how we can model coastal flooding using a raster elevation data set. What we're looking at here is a map document that contains data that we've previously processed. Specifically, we have a boundary for the community, uh, rather a polygon boundary for the community of Marblehead, Massachusetts. We have an elevation raster that's been clipped to the community of Marblehead, uh, Massachusetts using that Marblehead polygon as a mask and then we have surrounding communities um, to give some context. So what we're interested in doing is identifying what parts of the raster, what parts of the community would be flooded under uh, a variety of scenarios. So the way to understand this is that the elevation raster is essentially a grid of cells, each cell containing an elevation above mean sea level. So if we wanted to know what would be flooded, uh, we want to basically uh, imagine a scenario in which the mean sea level rises uh, so that if we Assume, for example, that the sea level rose by 10 feet uh, for a variety of reasons, then we'd essentially subtract that number from the current elevations that are in the raster and assume that anything below zero, anything that's negative, is essentially now below water. So the scenario that we're going to use here is to imagine what areas of uh, the coast would be flooded if uh, the sea level rose to 15 feet above the current mean sea level, which is not um, actually that extreme. Um, current estimates from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration um, show that by the end of the century, it's conceivable that uh, with a combination of rising sea level, high tide, and then storm surge from, an, from a strong storm, this could in fact be a reality. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we're going to be using a uh, tool from the Arc Toolbox called Map Algebra. So I'm going to open the Arc Toolbox, and in the under the Spatial Analyst toolbar, you're going to find a toolbox called Map Algebra, and we're specifically interested in the raster calculator. So I'll double-click on that to open that tool up, and what it's going to prompt me to do is to enter an expression that I want to evaluate, and it's sort of like a query in that sense, but it's more like math because what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate all the cells in the raster to see if they match uh, a particular con mathematical condition. So I'm going to double click on the name of the raster that I want to evaluate and then I'm going to put my expression in. And so I said before that we're interested in here in looking at identifying cells that would be underwater in, in a scenario where the water level is 15 feet above the current mean sea, mean sea level. So we have to remember though that what we're working here is that the elevation values in the raster are in meters, not in feet. So we need to convert our idea of feet into meters so we can put it in the expression. So 15 feet, there's uh, approximately uh, 3.28 feet in a meter. So we're going to take our 15 foot idea and divide it by 3.28. Okay, And so that gives us a value of approximately 4.6, let's say. So we're going to put in here, air, we're looking for areas that are less than or equal to 4.6 meters. Right? Again, remember what we're working with. I've previously set up my um, environment uh, for this session so that the workspace is already set to the personal geodatabase that I've created pre uh, previously so that I can keep track of all the, all the work I've done. So it's already going to create a, a raster file called raster calc when I do this process. So it's gonna, what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to evaluate every single cell in the grid and look to see whether or not that cell value is below or equal to 4.6. So I'm going to hit OK, and it's going to process through this to create that new raster. And when I close this dialog window, I can see the results of that process. The new raster that it creates has essentially two possible values for every single grid cell. It's essentially the same extent as the original grid, but now all the cells have only these two possible values. So rather than elevations, they have one, which is the green, if that cell met the criteria, that is to say that it was less than or equal to 4.6, and zero if it did not meet the criteria. So essentially what we're interested in are all the green areas. So we want to ignore or get rid of the purple because it doesn't suit our purposes at this point. So we're going to do one more process to this raster. We're going to reclassify it so that we can eliminate the zeros. We don't really need them. So back in the ARC toolbox under the Spatial Analyst toolbox, uh, we're looking for another toolbox called Reclass. And in there, we're looking for a tool called Reclassify. So I'm going to double click on that, and I'm going to specify as the input raster that raster calc, the one that you just created, the reclass field is the value field. 
So these are the current values that exist in that raster calc raster. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of the zeros. So what we're going to do is in the new values, we're going to turn those zeros into no data. Right? That's an actual designation so that the computer ignores those cells. The twos, we don't need twos, we're going to make them one still. We're going to carry that over so that they stay that way and recognize those are the ones that met our criteria. And then if there are any no data cells in there already, those stay the same. And I'll hit the tab key just so that the value that I typed in takes. So this is what I should see in, in the new value. So all I'll have are the ones and then no data values. The output raster is going to again create a new layer, a new raster layer, and it automatically suggested a name. Again, it's going to my personal geo database because I've set it in the environment. So I'm going to hit OK. And it's going to reclassify the raster. And now I'm going to turn off the original one. And so what you see now, this kind of brownish splotches, are just the cells that met our criteria. That is to say that they fall below that elevation value that we input with the map algebra. So we're pretty close to where we want to be. So if we wanted to figure out how much area this represents, that flooded area, uh, we can do that pretty quickly. We can go to the attribute table of this new raster. Uh, I right click on it and choose the open attribute table, open attribute. And what it's going to show me is the number of cells that contain this value. And since essentially we've eliminated the other cells, that's all there is. So there are approximately 29,961 cells in the, that have the value of 1. Those are the flood areas, right? So how much area is that, though? Well, what we need to know is the size of a cell. So if we look at the properties for the raster, which we should have looked at earlier, of course, to know what we're dealing with, we remember that the cell sizes are 5 by 5. And since we're working with a projected coordinate system, that means 5 meters by 5 meters. So every cell is approximately 25 square meters in area. So if we, again, take this number, 29,961, and we multiply it by 25, we have the area of flooded area, which is 749,000 square meters of area falls into the flood category. So that's how you know how much is there. And if you know that number, then you can calculate what percentage of the community is flooded. And luckily, the data that we're working with, the Marblehead boundary, is um, also in a projected coordinate system. So we have the area of the community as well. So we can simply divide our flood area by the total area to get the percentage, or the proportion, rather. However, there's some anomalies here. If you notice, we've got some patches that show that they're flooded, but they're not even connected to the coastline. So how would they be flooded? If you look more closely, you'll see that there's this area here that apparently fell into our criteria. It's below uh, 4.6 meters, um, but it's not connected to the coastline. So how would the water reach that? And so they're not hydrologically connected. So it seems unlikely that they could be flooded by coastal flooding, at least in the simple scenario that we're looking at. So we're going to say that's an anomaly, and we want to get rid of that. Well, the easiest way to do that, to fix that problem, is to convert the um, raster that we've reclassified into a polygon uh, layer or a vector file, and which will then let us edit this thing a little more easily. So what we're going to do then is we're going to do that. We're going to convert that raster into a vector polygon. So back in the Arc Toolbox, I'm going to look in the Conversion Tools Toolbox, and I want to go from raster, from raster toolbox, to polygon. So I'm going to double click on raster to polygon, and the input raster is going to be that reclassed raster. It's going to take the field values, right? There's, that's all that is there, and it's going to create a new polygon feature called raster to reclass, again defaulting to my, my uh, personal geo database. I've, I'm going to leave the default to simplify polygons, which is good because if, if it gets some funky edges from the raster, it'll try to smooth those out. It'll still look a little odd, though, in some places, but that's okay. So we'll hit OK, and we'll see that that is added to our um, map here. And I'm going to turn off the reclass so we can see this a little more carefully. In fact, I'm going to turn that to a nice bright yellow so it's very, very apparent. Okay. So now what we're looking at here are, is a vector polygon layer. Um, and this is going to allow us to do some editing. What we want to do is identify the polygons 
that actually touch the coastline. Um, and we're going to take the fact that we're going to we're going to assume that if it touches the coastline, then it can be hydrologically connected to the coast, which would allow it to be flooded. If it doesn't touch the coastline, then um, it, we, we're going to say that it really can't be flooded, at least not from coastal flooding. So the way that we identify those areas that touch the coastline is we're going to use a spatial selection method. So up from the selection menu, we choose select by location. And we want to select features from that raster reclass, right, that polygon layer we just created. And we want to identify where it, it touches this boundary of our community. But we're going to use the specific um, uh, spatial relationship. And essentially, we're looking for our crossed by the outline of the source layer feature. So what we're looking for is to identify those raster uh, flood polygons that cross the boundary of our community. So when I hit OK, you'll see that it highlights in blue polygons that are right along the coast, or touching the coast, and the ones that aren't are not highlighted, so they've been excluded. It's kind of interesting where this um, works, where it identifies and how it identifies, how precisely it does. If we zoom in just a little bit to look more closely, you can see how it grabs these areas along the close coastline and then leaves out areas that aren't there. So that's exactly what we want. So then this last step is we're going to export the selected polygons into a final layer. Right? And so I'm going to right click on that, on that um, uh, layer in the table of contents and go to data, export data. And it's going to create a new layer from just the select features. Now here it's defaulting to the wrong location, so I'm going to need to specify where I want it to go. So we're going to go into that uh, folder that has the data that I want. And I specifically want it to be a geodatabase feature class rather than a shapefile, as we might have done previously. So I can, when I change the file in personal geodatabase, the geodatabase shows up. So I want to go in there because it's kind of like a folder. And I'm going to say flood, whoops, flood, what do we call this, um, 15 feet. Okay. So then I'm going to save that and say OK. And I, yes, I do want to add it. Okay. And now you can see this new blue layer is the area that's flooded and is hydrologically connected to the coastline. And so we have then our final element. And so the last thing we might want to do with this is we want to estimate how much of the area is flooded. Well, the nice thing is that once we export or create a polygon layer within a geodatabase, the attribute table already contains a column that computes the area of all the polygons. So if we wanted to know the total area, we simply get the statistics from this particular column of shape area. It's calculated in the units of the coordinate system. And we can see that the sum area is about 700,000 um, square meters, right? Which is, so it's about 40,000 square meters less than we had previously. So um, that seems to make sense. So now we can take that number and we can divide it by the area of the total community. In this case, this number right here, and we can compute the proportion uh, and percentage of the community that would be flooded under this scenario.